for only $389 down. Une nouvelle ville est née. Ces écoles, ces rues calmes en font un paradis pour les enfants. setting with all the conveniences of city living. Drive out to Hidden Valley Acres today. And escape city taxes in an exclusive suburban community planned for the young executive. Un groupe urbain de grand luxe à quelques minutes seulement de la ville. Your children deserve the best. Applewood Farms Village is the best. Don't say no to life. Only five long-acting tablets a day. Exhausted, edgy, dragged down. Try. Un seul produit chimique permet une détente complète des muscles et de l'esprit, et cela sans aucun effet secondaire nocif. <laughs> The growth and spread and congestion of cities today have undermined the benefits that have made them so attractive. Instead of multiplying well-defined cities, we have let mere formless urban tissue spread at random over the surrounding countryside. In some ways, the city behaves like a living organism and thrives only when it cooperates with the whole world of living organisms. This need for cooperation goes far beyond the provision of recreational areas, the, the saving of farmland and wilderness areas, protection of water resources, important as all these are. Like an organism, our cities must achieve stability and continuity in the midst of complexity and change if they are to perform their higher function as the cradle and focus of man's creative activities. When cities were limited in size by natural conditions, when they relied on the country around for food, fuel, and recreation, there was a balance between city and country. In fifth century, Greece in the Middle Ages, in New England in Emerson's day. Urban life flourished under these limitations. If we would appreciate the need of maintaining a balance between the city and the countryside, we should examine the lively regional pattern of the Middle Ages. The medieval city at its best not only lived in balance with the countryside, but achieved a large measure of spiritual and temporal cooperation in its daily life. A sign of this triumph was the new role of even the city wall, now no longer representing chiefly aggressive aims. Surrounded by their walls, cities preserved their freedom, creating islands of peace in the anarchy of the feudal countryside. Within the wall, the city was a haven, almost a cloister.
the medieval city has been called a union of church and community in pursuit of the holy life. Though it often fell miserably short of that ideal, it produced a society that curbed arbitrary power and sacrificed private comforts to communal magnificence. Much of the energy of this community was spent not in trade, but in the glorification of God. Freedom, equality, democracy were never fully achieved, but for a brief time the concept of the community triumphed over power-seeking princes and prelates. From Christian ideals came the guilds, religious fraternities of workmen, artisans and merchants. To work was to pray, the saying went. That common faith gave a higher status to work than ever before. Forced labor, the shame of earlier urban cultures, gradually disappeared. Through the guilds and the monastic orders, there was a better provision for the sick, the aged, the suffering, the poor, than in any previous urban society. Like the city itself, the hospitals, almshouses, and other homes were usually small and neighborly. All that the modern state seeks to do on a wholesale scale was first done in the medieval town in a more intimate way, and probably with more feeling for the human occasion. This was the medieval city. Within the wall, security, but also freedom and unity. To this magnet, people were irresistibly drawn, sometimes for freedom, sometimes for gain, always for a better life. Cities won rights to have local laws and courts. These and other powers, once belonging only to kings, now belonged to the city. New towns sprang up everywhere, for, it was said, city air made people free. Citizenship, a free association not based primarily on birth or wealth, and not dependent on an underlayer of slaves, was a new fact in urban history. life of the medieval city is best reflected in the procession or pageant that winds about the streets and places and makes its way to the church. The spectators are also communicants and participants. They engage in the spectacle, watching it from within, not just from without, or rather feeling it from within, acting in unison, citizens, yet still individuals. The spiritual and temporal equilibrium of the medieval city usually was matched by harmonious relationships with the region. The rural charms were incorporated into the heart of the city, and the countryside was just beyond the city walls. The best medieval cities had higher standards of open space than most cities of today. Agricultural and rural pursuits often formed part of the daily life of the city. The typical medieval city was not merely in the country, but of the country.
Despite this long history of harmonious living, the ancient urban forces of expansion finally disrupted the balance of the medieval social order in the 15th century, and all about was set in confusion. The unity of the great church itself was broken in the struggle for power. The Renaissance despot entered the scene and refashioned the city in his own ruthless image. City and countryside became battlegrounds for conflicting cultures and dissonant ways of life. Since the disruption of the medieval social order, the cities that grew fastest have progressively lost their harmonious regional relationships. Everywhere the relentless advance of the city is despoiling the natural resources of metropolitan areas. The healthy unity between city and region, indeed their very common survival, is threatened as never before by modern powers of mechanical expansion. What is replacing the once green regional areas unfortunately cannot be termed city. In most cases it is just urban tissue, the formless fabrication of the real estate developer, where artificial substitutes take the place of the original natural attractions. These spreading fringes of our overgrown cities offer neither the variety and liveliness of the city nor the freshness quiet and safety of the countryside. The land within reach of people who live in the metropolitan areas is already insufficient for all their needs. Yet we permit our cities to thrust out heedlessly into the countryside, consuming our natural birthright at alarming speeds. The present growth of the total urban population, even the population explosion itself, is not the most serious threat to the balance of town and country. The more serious danger is the concentration of growth in metropolitan areas, already congested to the point of inefficiency and disorder, and already flowing together in a formless urban mass. The more our cities grow, the less that can be called a city remains. The well-being of our cities, indeed their very lives, requires a change of our supposedly progressive attitudes and beliefs, in particular our faith in unlimited mechanization as a substitute for intelligent, disciplined humanization in the fashion that the great cities of the past exemplified. If both city and country are to keep their character, we can no longer, it seems to me, Treat land as a commodity to be bought and sold in the ordinary market sense. Land is limited, irreplaceable, and immovable. 
particularly in cities and around them. Its value depends on the collective efforts and expenditures of all citizens, far more than on those of the man who may own it. To conserve the resources all communities need, land should be controlled in the public interest. Even private land has public responsibilities. More than this, we must question the notion that the expansion and congestion of our cities is inevitable and beneficial. Urban growth has been automatic only because we believe more in automatic processes than in the available human means for controlling them. Beyond a certain stage, mere size reduces the efficiency, vigor, and attractiveness of a city. The living hearts of London, Paris, New York, and Montreal were more vital before they were overburdened by their clogged arteries and their paralyzed extremities. Some countries are experimenting with new methods of urban growth and are forming a new urban pattern. Stockholm's regional population has tripled to well over a million in 50 years. But in these days of rapid transportation, Stockholm is not overburdened by sprawling fringe areas. While still within easy reach of all the attractions of the city, the fringe areas can instead be pleasant, separate communities at some distance from the mother city. Much of Stockholm's growth has been located in such satellite communities through a combination of public ownership and control of land and wise transportation policies. Stockholm's satellites are linked by rapid transit as well as by road and yet are separated by green areas of farmland wild countryside and parkland. The new communities are not simply dormitory suburbs. Most of them have attractive and lively community hearts though most of the people continue to work in Stockholm. Like a medieval city, Stockholm is not only in the country, but of the country. There is a superb relationship of nature's setting and man's building, though this has sometimes been achieved with a density of housing not usually associated with country life. London has tried to carry the policy of decongestion and decentralization even further. It has built eight new towns in the metropolitan region, each set in the green countryside and forever protected from encroachment or sprawl. Each of the new towns is built up around an old town or village always with respect for both the man-made and the natural heritage, and with plenty of open space in each neighborhood. Unlike the Stockholm satellites, the new towns like Harlow, 23 miles from London, are economically self-contained with their own industries close to residential areas, and with large and busy town centers.
It is too soon to tell whether the new towns can fully succeed without creating a new form of regional cooperation. They are too small to provide all the attractions and services that draw people to cities. If several of these towns had been politically and culturally federated, they could have pooled their resources to have a university, a repertory theater, and other things that large numbers of people alone make possible. Scotland is trying a scheme to bring new life to old communities. Scotland has built three new towns for half the people who are being resettled from the slums of Glasgow, but the other half, about 150,000 people, are moving in small numbers to relatively static old country towns like the royal borough of Haddington. More than two dozen such towns in Scotland are taking part in similar voluntary resettlement schemes. Housing for the newcomers is built with financial help from the national government and from the city of Glasgow. The whole scheme is closely coordinated with the resettlement of old industries or the establishment of new to employ the new citizens. Paddington plans to add about a thousand people to its population. Already the newcomers are increasing the town's prosperity and vitality. Some cities haven't yet become overgrown. To preserve its magnificent natural setting, Ottawa has decided to control its growth and keep the city population to about half a million people. Forty-one thousand acres of land have been bought by the national government as part of its broad regional plan for Canada's capital. This controlled belt of almost 65 square miles around the city will contain some government offices, some types of factories, and of course, parkland. All part of the protective area beyond which the city's future growth will take place. But most of this belt will remain what it is chiefly today, productive farmland. Ottawa believes that its future citizens will always find the countryside close at hand. Dynamic regional growth will continue, but the balance of city and country will be preserved for the benefit of all. None of these experiments in maintaining the balance of the city region is by itself a complete solution to the uncontrolled and haphazard growth of our cities. And any solution for any city must suit its particular history, location, climate, character, and people. But these experiments are moving in the right direction. And they all have three things in common the control of the use of land in the public interest, and the acceptance of limits to the size of the city, and the creation of a larger urban unit, based not on the past form of the big metropolis, but on the whole region. Cities once were islands dotting a wide green sea, but now in many metropolitan regions, the green farms and forests are disappearing in an urban sea of asphalt, concrete, brick and stone. One community is merging with its neighbor, and in that merging, each will lose the land that provided food, recreation and education. 
Each will lose also what remains of its individuality. As our mechanical facilities grow, the social purposes of the city diminish and the many-sided life the city once provided vanishes. Our current methods of urban congestion and expansion bring more and more of worse and worse. As a score of experiments has already shown, this aimless expansion is neither inevitable nor irreversible. The essential equilibrium of city and countryside can be maintained, and balance can be restored within a green regional setting, so that urban life will once again flourish. <laughs>